ought to have good news and bad news. The bad news is tonight is the last lesson in Genesis series. The good news is there is plans to follow. Now, some of you ask, when will we know? I'll tell you next week. One other announcement. If you are tech savvy, if you go to hillwoodbaptist.org, that is the new website, you actually can go to the sermon notes and you can click on those and you can, tie, you can fill them in on your iPhone, your iPad, and you can email those to yourself. So if some of you like to use your phone instead, that is now an option. However, that's only for the current Sunday morning or Wednesday night Bible study. We walked through Genesis. Last week we looked at the table of nations. We come to chapter 11 tonight. And I've told you since the beginning that if you understand this, you'll understand the rest. Genesis chapter 11, beginning with verse 1, we'll look at the, verse, the first nine verses. Genesis chapter 11, beginning with verse number 1. If you're able, able and capable, would you stand for the reading of God's Word? Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they, as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used the brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. They said, come let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. Let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to the sea of the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do, and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come let us go down there, confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, his name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Church, you may be seated. As we look at this tonight, we realize that we realize that open rebellion against God can be harmful to not only ourselves, but to others as well. In the narrative in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, reports the divine intervention among the human family to scatter across the face of the earth by striking at the heart of their unity, their, their language. The predominant idea of the account is not the Tower of Babel, but the scattering. This passage will explain to the reader how the many nations came to be divided on the earth. The story contains God's judgment on the sin of the Shinarites. Their major error was not building of a city or a tower, but the attempt to unite and live only in one place. God's original commission, their sin as well, may be labeled hubris. That is, immense pride that led to disobedience. In addition to identifying their proud ambition, the story also reflects their anxieties. Tonight, if you have your notes, you'll see I have just two basic points, two main thoughts. There is some subdivision, but two main thoughts in this passage tonight. The first I want us to look at is pride can lead to rebellion against God. Pride can lead to rebellion against God. In the first verse, a short prologue to the account informs the reader that the entire race had a common language. Remember, this refers back to chapter 10, verse 1. The entire race had a common language. Man, wouldn't that be nice? I can remember I was talking to someone the other day about being in Russia and how hard it was. I mean, church, understand, you couldn't order McDonald's. I mean... 
you, you couldn't order. The only thing I remember was I want a ball show of Pepsi with ice because Russians don't drink ice. And Sabaro so had Pepsi, and you can say, ball show of Pepsi with ice, which means give me the absolute biggest, largest one you have with ice. And McDonald's was like, I want that. Well, that could be a Big Mac, a McDouble, a McChicken, or something else. And you can't say, well, that's not order because that's what you said. Well, you, you are right. Imagine if we all spoke one language, how neat that would be, but yet it'd be kind of boring. Imagine if we all looked like Gary, talked like Gary. How interesting that would be. The whole earth had one lip to indicate the speech, one vocabulary to indicate the content of what they said, and the entire race is united in one language. However, when we come to verse 2, it came about as a journey to ease that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Pride can lead to rebellion against God. But we're also careful in that rebellion, disobedience, can, disobedience to God's word can happen. If we're not careful, the narrative records that the, that the human family migrated off east and settled in the region of ancient Babylon. That should be key to you. If you're Old Testament scholars, you know how important Babylon will be, not just now, but in the course of Old Testament history. Remember, the night they will wind up spending 70 years in Babylonian captivity. And so as they begin to travel off to settle into the region of ancient Babylon, that, that verb there describes that journey. It carries the idea of Bedouins who were moving tents by stages. Their wandering continued in earnestly direction for Armenia, but yet they settled in Shinar where they found a plain. This valley of the world, as Talmud calls it, became the designated place for the nomad settlers. They journeyed east. And church, if we're not careful, when you look at the rebellion and you disobey God's word, understand the, the reality of the, of the stage that you're setting for yourself. You're putting yourself in harm's way. You're putting yourself in a dangerous situation. Pride can cause us to disobey God's word. Secondly, pride can cause us to disobedience leads to proud ambition. Disobedience leads to proud ambition. Look in verse 3. They said to one another, come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. Now understand, they're happy making bricks right now. Wait till they get to Egypt. That will change. And so you have the ambition here. In verse 3, they made bricks. And they begin to realize that we can make brick and stone. And, hey, this is neat. Let's see what we can do. And so in verse 4, they said, come let us build for ourselves a city. Now, understand me. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with building a city. However, if you notice, the verse does not stop there. And if we're not careful, the pride reaches the point to say, I'm never content. I've got to have more. I've got to have more. I've got to have more. And we reach the point, we're never content. Because the world outside those doors says what? You need a big house. A big 401k, a big, nice, flashy car. You need all of these wonderful things of the world, and the more stuff you have, the happier you're supposed to be, and that is a lie from the pits of hell. And they realize that, hey, we can make a city, but oh, that's not enough. Let's build a tower so tall it will reach heaven. Here's the problem. 
They hadn't studied Old Testament theology. There's three heavens. I, I, I got to share this story. A few weeks ago, Kinsley had a chance to go meet up with her former class from Mississippi at the space station. And so, being the wonderful person that I am, I booked a tour guide. And I was sitting beside him. And we're looking at all these pictures of outer space, and I'm thinking, man, God did all that. And you look and said, let us build a tower that reaches into heaven. Which heaven? Is it the one that the birds fly? Is it the one that the stars are in? Is it the one that God, that God occupies? Which heaven? Because they weren't content with enough. The city wasn't the place to stop. And church, if you look at the pages of Scripture, rebellion and pride is what drove everything. Pride is what caused Satan to be kicked out of heaven. He wanted to overthrow God. So, Brother Jeff, you're a little bit excited. I, I don't know if I'm excited or I'm just that tired. I don't know which one it is. Pride leads to ambition. I said, let us build a tower. A tower so tall, a, a fortress, an acropolis, one that would, that would touch heaven. And disobedience leads to proud ambition. But thirdly, disobedience, as I've already mentioned, is fueled by pride. And if you're not careful, church, please hear me. A wise person once said, pride comes before the fall. And if we're not careful, pride, arrogance, ego can begin to set in. And that's what happened here. That They reached the point that they wanted something to be proud of. And I understand there's nothing wrong with being proud of things. I mean, please hear me. There are things in, in my house that, that I'm proud of that probably don't, may not matter a lot to you. There's things in your house that mean a lot to you that may not mean a lot to me. And there's nothing wrong with being proud of things. But when that thing or things becomes another God, we're now skating on thin ice. We now find ourselves in the proverbial boat going down the proverbial creek with a proverbial hole in the boat and no proverbial paddle. Going over a bunch of proverbial rocks. And if we're not careful, when our lives are fueled by pride, it can cause us to look at things differently, not think clearly, and not count the cost of what is to follow. Again, he would please hear me. There's nothing wrong with being proud of things. Let me ask you a question. How many of you are grandparents? How many think your, grand, your grandkids are the best kids ever? Amen. Okay, now, how many of you are great-grandparents? Great See? Any great-great? Just, just out of curiosity. Uh, we got one. See, Becky's great times two. Now, again, your grandkids are, they're the best ever. Same thing with your kids. Your kids, because why? They're yours. Again, there's nothing wrong with being proud of certain things. It's when pride, like they begin to build the city, realize it wasn't enough. Let's make a tower now. Let's make something that's bigger because this wasn't good enough. And so we look at this church, we see that again, pride leads to rebellion against God. And please hear me, this theme will not stop in Genesis 11. This, pride, this will continue. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Psalms, Proverbs, Minor Prophets, on to Malachi, even, even... Even that little blank page in the Bible that there's no writing. 
Oh, y'all's Bible don't have that? On into Matthew, Mark, Luke, all the way when? To the book of Revelation. Pride will always be a part of humanity. It will always be a part of your life and a part of mine. It's how we wrestle with that. Second thing. Pride will not be permitted by God. Amen or oh me. Church, can I tell you something tonight? God is a loving God. God is a gracious, God is a merciful God. God is a just God. God is a, God, God is a God of wrath, of God of anger, but God is also a jealous God. Now, please hear me, Hillwood. That word jealous is not the way we would use it in our English vernacular. See, it's one thing to say, I'm jealous of someone who has hair. I mean, you know, there are days it'd be nice to kind of, you know, feel my hair blowing in the, in the wind. It would be nice, but it, it doesn't happen. But when you think about God, God is not in that same type of connotation. When you hear the word jealous, what God says is God does not want to be second. God does not play second fiddle. And when you look at this, pride will not be permitted by God. Please hear me tonight. And I, and I don't want to get my cart before my horse. But if you remember, <clears throat> there are moments later on in Scripture when things begin to take the place of God that somehow those walls begin to fall down. Because for some reason, when you put things ahead of God, understand God, there'll be ways that, that God tears those walls down. It's not by, by accident that you walk in one day in that job that you spent your whole life at, that you sacrificed everything to get where you are, also to walk in and say, hey, by the way, your services are no longer needed here. It's not by accident that that car that you have spent your whole life in all of a sudden one day is outside in the middle of a hailstorm destroyed. Pride will not be permitted by God. And the second half of this passage reflects the first, beginning with the Lord's investigation of the city and the tower that the humans had begun. Look in verse 5. The Lord came down to the city and the tower which the sons had built. Verse 6. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. God will investigate proud, rebellious acts. The description here, written like a very human-like description, describes the Lord's close interest and participation in human affairs. He did not need to come down and look at their work. In fact, his coming down implies prior, implies prior knowledge. Understand, does God know everything? Then why do we live our lives like we think he don't. I mean, let's just, let's just be honest here. Because that was the same thing here. God came down, but God already knew what was going on. God knew what was taking place. In the words of Casuto, one could say that no matter how high the tower, the Lord still had to descend to see it. This was not satire that the Lord came down the point clearly here is that the tower was to reach the heavens. However, I love this. I love this. It fell short. It fell short. The prophet Jeremiah said this. 
And, I, and I've always made this statement, and I've always prefaced with a question, and no one has ever asked, but I know that there are certain ones in the audience that this question is going to get asked. And I remember the prophet Jeremiah said, Lord, the very best I have is nothing but filthy rags. And so like, well, what is a filthy rag? If you want to know, see me after service. The very best I have. And they built a tower. But it fell short. Church, how many times in our life do we strive, but we fall short? How many times do we strive, but we fall short? To be honest, if, if I look at my life, and I try to measure up to God Almighty, I will never measure up. I'll never get there. But that doesn't stop me from striving to be like him. The purpose of the coming down was to see the work. And secondly, pride, so look at this. Pride will not be permitted by God. God will investigate proud rebellious acts. Secondly, God knows the danger of apostasy. Look at verses 6 and 7. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language, and this is what they began to do, and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Verse 7, Come, let us. Now, hang on. Question. How many of your Bibles have the word us capitalized? That is not by accident. That is not by coincidence. Come, let us... Go down and there, confuse their language that they will not understand one another's speech. And the Lord said, if, if, if as one people all having one language, they begin to act this way, now nothing, they, nothing that they propose to do will be out of their reach. However, church, the potential for calamity is dangerous to the race, and God will prevent it. They will nullify the purposes of God in favor of their own purposes which are within reach. Mm. Come, let us go down and confound their language that they cannot understand one another. Hmm. That's interesting. Because just a previous chapter, they all spoke the same language. And honestly, until about this verse... They all still spoke the same language. And God says, now let, let's, let's confuse them. Let's confound and let's jumble up all the languages. The year was 1996. For those of you that are wondering, I was 11 years old. And my mom worked for a grocery store, and the Sunbeam bread rep gave her a wonderful gift. We got Braves tickets. 30 rows up, right behind the first base dugout. And I got to go to Hotlanta. However, when we were in Hotlanta, something was going on. I was in Atlanta a week before the Olympics start. The day I left was the day that they bombed Centennial Olympic Park. As I was in the hotel, I was riding an elevator with some people from either Japan, China, Korea, and I'm sitting there, and they're talking. I have no clue what they're saying. And I'm going, I, I don't know what they said, but it must have been nice. I don't know. They're all laughing. I don't know. And so imagine the setting here. They've gone from all one language to now they're all speaking different languages. 
Imagine how you communicate. Imagine the confusion that takes place. If you look in the last couple verses, so the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Now understand, this is where all the nations begin to scatter and spread. This is where you get all the different nations. It begins here. And God would cut off the prideful expectations. So the, God, so the Lord scattered them from the, there across the face of the whole earth, and they ceased to build the city. The greatest fear came on them. Because back in verse 4, now follow me, Hillwood. Back in verse 4, what was their greatest fear? Because now they have left their greatest unity. The unity of the city, the unity of that confinement was unfinished as they had planted the rebellious races. A unified people did not fulfill its goal. And so now because the city wasn't finished, now they're scattered abroad and they left their little bubble of comfort to being scattered all over the face of the earth. The city wasn't finished. They're scattered now. When we come to verse 9, In verse 9, we see, therefore, his name was called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Because the Lord confused the lit, which means their language of all the earth and scattered them across the face of the whole earth, this explains to you and me how the nations came to be scattered Abroad. On a personal level, the text reveals the necessity of submissive obedience to the word of the Lord and warns against resisting through pride. Those who humble themselves in this way before God, God will exalt. But those who exalt themselves, God will abase. And so church tonight, as we have walked through this, and we find the point where we put the period at the end of the Genesis 1 through 11 study. And we see how all of this will shape our thought and our thinking and our reading and our studying when we come to God's Word from Genesis chapter 12 to Revelation. And how all of this plays out. But to say in closing... I would say this. We must be very careful when it comes to pride. We must be very careful when it comes to pride. So many times I've heard folks say, well, you know, that'll never happen to me. That'll never happen here. And oftentimes those that say that are the first to fall. It's easy to get caught up with everything else. It's easy to let all the things steal the focus of what's important. And if we're not careful, that little crack can creep in. And before you know it, what seemed like just a small creek now becomes an open door. And if we're not careful, we can find ourselves right smack dab in the middle of Genesis 11. We can think we built up all these things only to see them come crashing down. It was kind of unique that Bethany mentioned Vacation Bible School. 
A, because Vacation Bible School has changed since I was a kid. I mean, now they got all these neat-looking snacks. I mean, we got the little Walmart cookies and, and, and Kool-Aid, and that's all you got. But I remember learning songs. One of those was, The wise man built his house upon the rock. And how often, if we're not careful, that pride can cause us to build on the wrong foundation. I said I wasn't going to do this, but questions or comments? Yes, Drew. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. That is correct. Yeah, what Drew's saying is, is that, you know, like I said, the, the, the city would have been fine, but it, it's, it's the lack of contentment. You know, I, I want something more. And, and that's where the pride comes in. Good word, Drew. Good word. Yes. Pride is lack of contentment. That was Deborah McKay, not me. Sorry, y'all. I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in writing paper, so I'm used to citing everything I do. <laughs> that, that's, that, that's a Turavian citation there. Other comments or questions? Yes, Liz. That's a whole other study because as far as how they came back together, I'm not 100% sure because there's a, there's a, I don't want to use this word because I don't like this word, so y'all please forgive me. This is not theologically correct. There's a gap, and, I, and I'm not discussing gap theory, but what I'm saying is that, that there's a gap between the end of chapter 10 and chapter 11. And, and you see that multiple times in Scripture, uh, a, great, a great example. What happens to Joseph, the father of Jesus? At two years old, and at 12, he's with Mary, and they lose, they lose Jesus. Which that's another, and then it's like Joseph disappears. So to answer the question as far as they, how they got back together, I, there's, I'm not 100% sure to tell you. All I can say is that faith has to step in and go, okay, God, you brought it back together. Yes, Rob. Ah. Uh. <laughs> yes, Miss Becky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a good question. That's another sermon. <laughs>
Yes, Mr. Duty. Yes. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> yeah, if, if you're in the book of Genesis, if your last name was I, you're probably going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, if, if you weren't an I, you're probably the black sheep. <laughs> but I would, I would agree. That is, it, it is amazing how God does all of this without our input. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? <laughs> Gary, do you have a question? <laughs> well, since Gary has no questions, we will close in prayer. Father, we come in prayer tonight. And in the awesomeness and in the majesty of your perfect word, it is amazing to see your plan unfold. It's amazing to see that just not weeks ago we were discussing that literally the, at the sound of your voice, everything began. And now at the sound of your voice, Nations scattered. But Father, I pray tonight, may our hearts have a burden to not be prideful, but to seek you. And Father, when those moments come that we're prideful, Father, I pray that the walls that we build up, the cities, the towers that we build up, Father God, that you would just break them down to rubble. I know it would be painful. I know it would hurt. But like the psalmist says, there may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. Father, I thank you tonight for each person that's here. We all come from different backgrounds, different walks of life. But there's one thing that unites us. And it's not common interest. It's not common ground. But the one thing that unites us is the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of the blood, this is, these are my brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, tonight it's already been prayed, and Father, I pray as we go home that you'd keep us safe and that we look forward to gathering here Sunday to worship. And Father, I pray for Sunday for you to do something again like you did last Sunday, only this time do something bigger. And not for us, not for our glory. When folks ask what happened, that we become like Zechariah, just almost speechless. And all we, can, all we can say is, God. And all God's people said, Amen. Church, have a good evening.